chemical kinetics, uh, study of reaction rates, how fast reactions occur. So, after this lesson, you'll be able to, you should know how to, def you should be able to define, calculate reaction rate, describe typical time profiles for reactants and products during the course of a reaction, discuss how reaction rate is affected by concentration, temperature, surface area, and catalyst, define what a rate law is, uh, what a reaction order is, what a rate constant is, and discuss how rate laws are experimentally determined using initial rates method, the integrated rate law method, and the method of isolation. So this, this is what we would call empirical kinetics. Uh, in the second part of this uh, unit, we're going to be looking at action mechanisms, okay, molecular interpretation. Uh, for now, we're going to focus on just the macroscopic aspects. Okay. So reaction rate is the change in concentration of reactant or product per unit time. So which of the following would be units for a reaction rate? Concentrate, concentration unit time, per unit time, right? So it would be this one, moles per liter per second. How about this one? Moles per liter per minute. Okay. Moles per molecules per cubic centimeter per second. That's a concentration unit. Okay. Pressure, to a certain extent, can be considered as a concentration unit. So you might see rate expressed as torr per second. Why is that? If you are doing ideal gas law, PV equals nRT, P is equal to nRT over V, right? N over V is concentration. So pressure is directly proportional to concentration. All right. And so at a given temperature, and usually when you do rate studies, you make during for, for a given reaction, if you, while you're making your measurements, you maintain the, the temperature. You, you do measurements at constant temperature. Okay. So now, those would be units for uh, reaction rate. Now, sometimes you might see something like this just given as per cubic centimeter per second. So if it doesn't specify how you're, uh, what is your counting, it's molecules or atoms. Okay, and then this is commonly used for gas phase reactions. Moles per liter is commonly used for solutions in aqueous solution, but for gas phase reaction, common unit you might encounter would be tor per second or tor per minute or per cubic centimeter per second. All right. Interpreting rate symbols. Okay. This is just a view of freshman chemistry. Put a symbol in brackets. That means concentration in moles per liter. So put hydroxide in brackets. That's the concentration of hydroxide ions. Okay. Uh, derivative of the concentration with respect to time, that's the rate of change in the concentration of A per unit time. So what would be the unit for that? Moles per liter per second what would, be, would be A unit for that. So if as time advances, you're making more A, A is a product, right? Then this derivative is positive. That derivative is going to be negative if A is decreasing as time advances, okay? So um, if you want to express rates as just positive numbers, uh, if you're dealing with a reactant, if you're, so if you're consuming A as a reactant, then you know that dA dt is going to be a positive number, a uh, negative number. So we, if you put a negative in front of the derivative of the concentration of the reactant with respect to time, that would be a positive number. So that would be the rate of consumption of A. If you're dealing with a product, then you just take the derivative of a product with respect to time, product concentration with respect to time to get a positive number. Okay. Calculating reaction rates. Uh, concentration of reactant A drops from 0.1 molar to 0.05 molar in five seconds. What's the average rate of consumption of A? So here you see there's a negative because it's talking about consumption and 
when we say consumption, we're dealing with just the absolute value. So concentration of A final is how much? 0 0.050 moles per liter. And the initial concentration is 0 0.100 moles per liter divided by elapsed time is 5.00 seconds. What would that be? What is it? 1.9? 0 0.05 minus 0.1 divided by 5. 0.01 and positive, right? Since this is going to be a negative inside, so positive 0 0.01. How many sig figs? Two sig figs. Moles per liter. Right. Suppose you have a reaction, two moles of A plus a mole of B yields three moles of C. If C if A is being consumed at a rate of 0.4 moles per liter per minute, at what rate is B being consumed? So you just say 0 0.40 moles of A per liter per minute of A, right, times, let me make this unit uh, more obvious, 0 0.400 moles of A per liter per minute. So I want to know how, what rate is B being consumed, and I'm going to say times 1 mole of B for 2 moles of A. So the rate of consumption of B is half. Expect A to be consumed twice as fast as B. So it's going to be 0 0.20 moles per liter per minute. So, it seems like if you want to specify the rate of reaction, you have to specify what are you dealing with. Are you dealing with this reactant or that reactant or that product? So, the number that you cite has to include whether you're dealing with a, react, a particular reactant or a particular product. Right? So, uh, here... If it's 0.4 moles per liter per minute for consumption of A, what's the rate of production of C? It's 0 0.40 moles of A per liter per minute. Conversion factor would be 3 moles of C or 2 moles of A. Did I start recording? Yeah, I did. Okay. I always forget. It's like when I leave home. Did I turn up the stove? 0 0.20 times 3 is 0 0.60. Is that correct? Moles per liter per minute. Makes sense, right? 2 is to 3, so 4 is to 6. So, because you have to specify, when you're talking about rates in terms of consumption or production, you have to specify what reactant are you, are you talking about, what product are you talking about. If you just want to cite just one number and you don't specify what reactant or product you're dealing with, you just call that the rate of the reaction. And we're just going to say that if X is the rate of reaction, okay, then we call X. Uh, let's call it V to make it more like a speed. Okay, so if V is the rate of reaction, then we can say 2x, okay, is the rate of consumption of A. I mean 2V, not 
to B. And what's the rate of consumption of B? B would be the rate of consumption of B. And you can also say that 3V is the rate of production of C. Right. So that's how they they are all related, and in fact, what would be dx d uh, d concentration of a dt? What's the rate of uh, change in the concentration of a in this case? It's going to be negative two v. Why negative? Okay, because A will be dropping as time advances, so that derivative is going to be negative. So V here, we're just taking a positive value, absolute value for the rate of reaction. Okay, then we say 2V, 3V, V and 3V are the rate of consumptions of A, B, and the production of C. Derivative of the concentration of A with respect to time is negative 2V. What's the derivative of the concentration of B? Negative V. What's the derivative of the concentration of C with respect to time? Positive 3V. Okay. So in general, then we say, okay, what did we say the rate of consumption of A was? Is negative 2V. So uh, if I were to solve for V here, what would I write here? It's negative one half times the rate of change in the concentration of A, right? And I can also say that that's equal to negative of the rate of change in the concentration of B. And that's also equal to positive one third of the rate of change in the concentration of C. So you can see these numbers right here. Okay, this is negative one over one, right? These numbers right here are just the stoichiometric coefficients in your balance equation. So to answer this question, uh, if A is being consumed at a rate of 0.4 moles per liter per minute, what's the rate of reaction? What's the rate of reaction then? Then you say, if V is the rate of reaction, 2V is the rate of consumption of A, right? So 2V is equal to 0 0.40 moles per liter per minute. So the actual rate of reaction is half of 0 0.40 moles per liter per minute. And so your rate of reaction is 0 0.20 moles per liter per minute. Okay. Typical time profiles when a reaction occurs are illustrated in the diagram here, in the chart here. So which one do you think, which curve represents the typical time profile for a reaction? The red curve or the blue curve? The red curve starts off with some finite value and then it drops. And what happens to it over time? Eventually, it's going to reach an equilibrium value. It's not necessarily going to zero, right? It's just going to level off. So what's what's the derivative of the concentration of reactant with respect to time as time approaches infinity? It's going to approach zero. The slope. It's going to flatten out. The curve is going to flatten out. The slope is going to be zero. So that's a reactant. And which one's the product? Start out with nothing, and then it increases rapidly, and then it slows. The rate slows down, and then eventually it levels off. So rates of all reactions generally approach zero as time advances, because that's when you reach equilibrium. Okay. So when is the reaction fastest? Initial, initially, and when is its lowest? At equilibrium, right? 
as t approaches infinity. And why is the reactor not used up here? Just in general, reactions are reversible. When you have equilibrium, they do not necessarily go to completion. And in some cases, if you have two reactants, one rea even if the reaction does go essentially to completion, if you have two reactants, typically one reactant would be consumed first. And what do you call that reactant? The limiting reactant. And so you'll have an excess of the other reactant. Okay, so what factors affect reaction rates? Reactions are due to collisions between atoms or molecules. So more frequent collisions would generally mean faster rate. Now, not every collision is going to lead to a reaction. There's a minimum energy that they need, okay, the atoms or the molecules need, the colliding particles need, in order for that reaction to lead to collision, uh, to a reaction. So uh, the more energetic collisions, you would expect faster rates. Okay, uh, so that minimum energy is called the energy of activation. Now, uh, even if they have the right energy, that might not necessarily lead to a reaction either because in some cases, in fact, most cases, there's, there's a certain orientation that they have to be relative to each other in order for reactions to occur. Okay? So it's not just a matter of collisions. To a certain to a great extent, it has to do with how frequently they collide, but if they don't collide the right way without the right amount of energy, the reaction may not occur. So in general, how is a reaction affected by higher temperature then? Higher temperatures, what do we expect? More collisions? Okay. More collisions and more frequent collisions and faster rate in general. Uh, what about a higher concentration? The more crowded it is, the more collisions, more frequently the collisions will occur. So higher concentrations are generally generally lead to faster rates. Surface area. If we're dealing with a reaction involving a solid, a block of solid versus a powder, which one would react faster? Bottom. There's more surface area, there's more opportunities for collisions. Okay. A catalyst can also increase the reaction rate. A catalyst is something you add to your reaction mixture that, that speeds up the reaction. And it's not consumed, okay, uh, for it to be considered a catalyst, it has to be something that is not consumed in the reaction. So it, it, it helps the reaction. Uh, go faster, but it's not consumed. What it does is it provides an alternative mechanism, an alternative pathway for the reaction to occur that has a low activation energy. Okay, and that's how it speeds up reactions. Enzymes are examples of catalysts, and these are catalysts for reactions that occur in biological systems, which are called enzymes. Measuring reaction rates. How are we actually going to measure reaction rates in the lab? Uh, the traditional, simplest technique is to quench a sample of the reaction mixture taken at various times. So, you know, uh, let's say you want to carry out a reaction. Let's say you mix HCl. So you put some, okay, ethyl acetate maybe. Let's, uh, what's ethyl acetate? CH3, C, ethyl acetate. H2, F acetate would be CH3, so that's acetyl and then ethyl acetate, right? CH2, CH3. So here's your ethyl group, okay, and there's your acetate right there. It's an ester. Okay, so you react that with HCl, for example, so you put your ethyl acetate there. You mix it with HCl, and a reaction occurs. What happens when you mix an acid with an ester? You hydrolyze your ester. So it gives you acidic acid and ethanol, CH3CH2OH. OK? So as the reaction progresses, this reaction is going to form acidic acid.
uh, you're replacing so how can you monitor this reaction equation wrong. CH3, actually it's a hydrolysis reaction. CO, O, oops, O, CH2. Actually the acid is just a catalyst here. Okay, so your HCl is a catalyst. What happens here is this actually reacts with water. H2O. H2O this way. Okay. So one way of thinking about it is okay, this can go with that and this can go with that. Okay. So you have CH3 COOH plus ethanol CH3 CH2 OH. Okay. It's a hydrolysis reaction. You have ethyl acetate reacts with water. To give you CH2, CH2OH. Your HCl is a catalyst in this case, it speeds up the reaction. How does an HCl catalyze this reaction? It protonates this oxygen right here and facilitates the cleavage of this bond right here. So, anyway, uh, how can you monitor the progress of this reaction? As the reaction progresses, you'll be forming acetic acid and ethanol. Your H plus from your HCl remains constant, but during the reaction, you'll be producing an acid. So what do you do with, the, with your reaction mixture if you want to monitor the progress of this reaction? Use a pH meter, or the traditional way is... Uh, pH meter might be a hard thing to do because you've got a lot of acid there to begin with. But traditional way would be to take a sample, like a 10 mil sample of this solution. I'd say five minutes into the reaction, take a 10 mil sample. 10 minutes into the reaction, take another sample. 15 minutes into the reaction, take another sample. For each one of those samples, what you need to do is... You analyze the amount of acid that's formed, right? So how do you how do you analyze the amount of acid that's formed? You titrate with sodium hydroxide, right? Because you're going to have more and more acid as the reaction progresses. You're forming acetic acid. So, but when you take it out, you transfer it to a flask, the reaction will still keep going. So what you need to do is you quench that reaction. And how do you quench that reaction? How do you, when you take a sample out at the five minute mark, okay, you want to make sure you take a snapshot of that, the amount of reactants and products at that point in time. So how are you going to stop that reaction? Or at least slow it down considerably. Yeah. Put it in a lot of water or dump it in a bunch of ice, right? Cooling the reaction mixture will slow down the reaction. Diluting the reaction mixture lowers the concentration, slows it down. So you quench your, you quench your reaction, and then you can titrate. You can take your time titrating it. You don't have to rush titrating it because you you slow down the reaction. So that's what you do. You quench a sample of the reaction mixture taken at various times. Or another way, more modern techniques involve just uh, non-destructive methods. You just monitor a property that's related to the concentration of a reactant or a product. So you might you might try see to see if you can relate the pH to the amount of acetic acid form. Okay. Or if you have uh, if you have um, a colored reactant or product, you can use a spectrophotometer or a colorimeter. To measure the absorbance as the reaction progresses. So if your reaction produces a colored product, what happens? Or in this example, you have a reactant that's blue and your product is colorless. 
what would happen as the reaction progressed? The absorbance of your solution is going to be dropping, right? The, the a blue color, if your reactant is blue and your product is colorless as the reaction progresses, the blue color is going to fade. So if you're going to do this using spectrophotometry, uh, what wavelength would you use to monitor the concentration of the reactant as time progresses? Remember Roy G. Biv? So what's the complement of blue? Orange. So the wavelength of light you'll be using would be um, so what would be that wavelength? Around 600, 590, 580. 590 is yellow. Six, and you get into the 600s, that's red, so around 600 nanometers. Okay. A rate law is an equation that summarizes how a reaction rate depends on the concentration of reactants and catalysts, if your reaction involves a catalyst, at a given temperature. Okay, so it's an equation that summarizes the dependence on concentration. So here's an example of a rate law. Typically, the rate law, a rate law can be written in this form. Rate is equal to some constant K times concentration of reactant or catalyst raised to some power and times the concentration of another reactant or catalyst raised to another power. So uh, the exponents in this equation is called your reaction order. So in this particular example, we say that the reaction is second order with respect to A and it's first order with respect to B. Now, if C was a reactant in this particular reaction and this rate law happens to be given by this, what's the order of the reaction with respect to C? That would be zero. Okay, so if you had C there, C raised to the power zero would just be one. Okay? Now, this rate constant, it's a constant only for that given temperature that you're doing your experiment. So that actually depends on the temperature. So that's what's, that's how the temperature affects your reaction rate. It, the, the, uh, the effect is factored into that rate constant right there. Incorporated in there. So if I have rate equals K times A squared times B, what's the effect of doubling A on the rate? If I multiply this number here times 2, what happens to my rate? Quadruples. Four times. If I triple my A, what happens to my rate? 9 times. B squared is 9. If I doubled my B, what happens? The rate doubles 2 times. If I triple my B, rate is tripled. If I double my C, no effect, right? So zero order means no effect. If the rate is zero order with respect to a particular reactant or catalyst, then that the concentration of that has no effect on the rate. First order means it's directly proportional. Second order means the rate is directly proportional to the square of the concentration. What's the unit for your rate constant? It will depend on your overall order. So for example, let's say your rate is equal to K times concentration of X squared times concentration of Y. Right? Your overall order is just the sum of the orders of the reaction. So 2 plus 1 would be 3. Okay, so what would be the rate the unit for rate constant here. Let's look at it this way. Um, so rate equals k times x squared times y. What would be the unit for k? Well, let's solve for k. k is going to be rate over x squared y, right? So unit for rate is what? Concentration per unit time, 
what's the concentration of uh what's the unit for the denominator concentration squared concentration okay so in other words in general the unit for the denominator is just molarity or concentration unit raised to the power o or o is the overall order so the unit for your rate constant is molarity raised to the power one minus o per unit time in this case it's going to be what if it's third order molarity raised to the power one minus three per second so your rate constant is going to be molarity per molarity squared per second all right uh, so in general your k unit is concentration unit raised to the power one minus n or n is the overall order per unit time so if i were to tell you the rate constant is given as something per minute as, as per minute what's the what's the overall order of the reaction this means one minus n is equal to zero so n is equal to one so first order rate constants just have a unit of reciprocal time how about this one what's liters per mole molarity is moles per liter so what's liters per mole so it's molarity to the negative one and that's inverse molarity so inverse molarity per second so what what's our n in this case our n in this case is two right one minus n is equal to negative one so n is equal to two so second order how about this one moles per liter per second this is moles per liter to the power one right per second that means one minus n is equal to one so n must be zero so overall a zero order how about this one centimeters to the negative six that's per cubic centimeter squared per second so that's actually my atoms or molecules per centimeter so this is like a concentration unit i'm sorry centimeters to the centimeter cube to the negative two okay so this concentration unit uh, no. no, it should be negative 3 squared, right? So, centimeter to the negative 3 squared. So, per cubic centimeter is a concentration unit squared per second. So, what would this be? 1 minus n is equal to 2. So, what is n? Huh? 1 minus negative 1. Okay. So your n is negative 1. That means uh, that means 1. It's inversely proportional to the concentration. Okay. Um, to determine the reaction order, a uh, commonly used technique is the initial rates method. In the initial rates method, you do at least two runs. Okay? And in these two runs, you keep all the initial concentrations the same except for the reactant that you want to study. So let's take a look at this uh, table right here. We did two experiments involving reactants A and B. Experiment one, you have 0.1 moles per liter of A and 0.200 moles per liter B. 
experiment two, you have point two for A and point two for B. Which reaction do you think are we trying to study here? We want to know how the rate of the reaction is affected by what? By A. You're holding your B constant, you're changing your A. Okay? So that's the idea. And you measure the initial rates. What do we mean by initial rates? Remember we said that your reactant is going to be dropping and then uh, leveling off. Okay, what's your initial rate? It's just going to be DA, A is a reactant, so it's going to be DA, DT, right? At, what's, initial, what's our initial time? T equals zero. So that slope right there. Uh, DA, DT is going to be, if you want a rate of consumption, yeah, you put a negative there. Right? And if you're just using absolute values, then uh, the absolute value would be the negative of the derivative, right? So that's just the negative of that slope would be the absolute value, would be the rate of consumption of uh, reactant A if that was the time profile for reactant A. Okay? So initial rates. In practice, what you do is this part of the graph is usually very steep. Okay, so, you know, you can just get the average rate for the earliest part of your reaction. Okay. For a very short amount of time, if you can make a significant, you can notice a significant drop in the concentration of your reactant. Just take the change in the concentration divided by the elapsed time. That would give you a good estimate for your initial rate. So, how about this one? Which pair of experiments would allow us to determine the order of reaction with respect to reactant A? <coughs> so you have a mix. <coughs> sorry. You have a reaction between A and B, aqueous solutions. So experiment one, you mix two mils A, two mils B, and six mils water. Reaction two, you mix four mils A, two mils B, six mils water. Experiment three, you mix four mils A, two mils B, and four mils water. Which pair of experiments would let you determine the order of reaction with respect to reactant A? 1 and 2, 1 and 3, 2 and 3. 1 and 2. Okay. How about 1 and 3? So, 1 and 3 versus 1 and 2. Which one? It's a trick question. <laughs> These are milliliters, right? What do you want to do? You want to maintain concentrations. Okay, what's the total volume here? These are all aqueous solutions, so you can pretty much assume that more or less the volumes will add up. So what's the total volume for experiment one? 10 mils. Experiment two? 12 mils. Experiment three? 10 mils. All right. Now, if you want to study reactant A, you want this to be constant, right? Need a constant concentration of B. You want the initial concentration of B to be the same for the two runs that you are going to compare. Which one will give you the same concentration of B? One and three. Okay? Because you're using two mils of B and 10 mils total. So your whatever stock solution you have of B will be diluted fivefold. But A would be, you'll be doubling the concentration of B. All right, let's look at this one. What's the order of the reaction with respect to reactant B based on the data shown below? What should we do? So these are initial rates. So we say rate equals K times A to the power A. 
times concentration of B raised to the power B, where B is the a, little a and little b are the orders of reaction. So from experiment one, okay, we want to know reactant B. So which experiments would we be using? Two and three. Two and three has the same B. We want to know what the reaction order with respect to B is. So you're going to compare experiment one and two because they have the same concentration of A. So let's see. Rate one is how much for experiment one? 0 0.050 mean moles per liter per second equals K times, what's our A here? 0 0.10 raised to the power A times our B is 0 0.10 raised to the power B. Okay. That's experiment one. And experiment two, right here. So the rate is 0 0.050 moles per liter per second equals K times 0 0.10 moles per liter. Okay, I forgot my unit there. Moles per liter raised to the power A times 0 0.30 raised to the power B. So you triple the concentration of B while maintaining the concentration of A. What happened to the rate, initial rate? It changed from 0 0.05 to 0 0.05, actually did not change. So even without doing calculations, zero order. Right. How do you show that? Using, the, using an actual calculation, you're going to say, if you take experiment, the numbers from experiment one, divide that by numbers for experiment two, what do you get? One is equal to, K cancels out, point zero one, point 0.1 raised to the power A cancels out. So you'd, you'd end up with, on the right side, point 0.10 over point three zero, molarity unit cancels out raised to the power B. So that's one third raised to the power B is equal to one. What number do you have to raise something in order to get one? B equals zero. How about this one? What's the order of reaction based on the data shown? If you want order of reaction with respect to A, which two experiments are we going to compare? One and three or two and three? I'm going to compare two and three because that's where you have a constant concentration of B. So you're going to say what? When it doubled from point 0.1 to point 0.2, what happened to the rate? So what's the order of reaction? First order, okay? And you can show that because most of the time you're not going to get nice numbers like that. You know how to, you need to know how to work it out. You can say from experiment two, you have what's the rate? 0 0.10 moles per liter. Oops, our rate is how much? 0 0.05 moles per liter per second equals K times concentration of A is 0 0.10 molar raised to the power A. Concentration of B is 0 0.30 molar raised to the power B. And for experiment 3, we say 0 0.10 moles per liter per second equals K times concentration of A is 0 0.20 moles per liter raised to the power A. Concentration of B is 0 0.10 moles per liter, oops, 0 0.30 moles per liter raised to the power B. So if you divide the data from experiment two with the data from experiment three, you get, what's 0 0.05 over 10, over 0.1, sorry, which is 0.50, okay? equals k cancels out 0.3 raised to the power b cancels out 
So what do we have on the right side? 0.10 over 0 0.20 raised to the power a. So you see that 0 0.50 is equal to 0 0.50 raised to the power a. Obviously, a is equal to 0.50. Quick review. You're not, you may, like I said, you're not always going to get nice round numbers that we've shown earlier. What if you got an equation that looks like this? How would you, so when you did something similar to what we did earlier, well, how would you solve for x here? Take the log of both sides. So log of 0.242 is equal to x times log of 0.489. And you solve for x, so divide both sides by log of 0.489. And that allows you to solve for x. And chances are, if you're dealing with experimental data, you're not going to get a nice round whole number. It will be something close to a whole number. Okay. Now, it's possible for, uh, typically, reaction order should be uh, an integer or half integer. It's possible for it to be half integers. Okay, so round off to the nearest half integer. Okay, now after you've determined your re reaction orders, what you need to do next is just plug in experimental values in, into the rate law and solve for k, right? So you can do your experiments, determine the rate, uh, the order of reaction with respect to a and b. And so this is a summary of what we've done earlier, okay? So we've shown that it's first order with respect to AY. You double your A, you double your rate. So it's first order. And we've seen comparing experiments one and two that if you triple your B while maintaining A, the rate doesn't change. So it's zero order with respect to B. So now that you've determined the rate law, okay, you have the orders. The last thing to determine is the rate constant. How do you determine that rate constant? Simply all you have to do is plug it into any one of these experiments. So you have your rate equals k times a raised to the power 1, b raised to the power 0. You can solve for k. So what's our unit for k here? So it's going to be 0 0.050 moles per liter per second divided by 0 0.10 moles per liter. Molarity cancels out. What's 0 0.05 divided by 0 0.1? 0 0.50 per second, right? And is that consistent with what we know about the rate, the units for the rate constants? If the unit for the rate constant is just per unit time, then it's a first order overall. And you can see this first order overall. 1 plus 0 there is equal to 1. All right. Now, uh, it's preferable that you actually do a series of experiments rather than just two experiments to determine the order of reaction with respect to a particular reaction. So let's say you have a reaction between Z and Y where the initial concentration of Z is held constant. So we're holding Z constant. So what are we trying to do here? We're changing the concentration of Y. So we're trying to determine the order of reaction with respect to what? To what? We're trying to determine how Y affects the reaction rate. And so you can do a series of experiments where you vary the initial concentration of one of the reactants, so in this case Y, so you go 0 0.01, 0 0.015, 0 0.02, 0 0.025 moles per liter, and you measure the rate, okay? And so here's your rate law. Rate equals K times concentration of Z raised to the power little z. Little z is the order of reaction with respect to Z, times concentration of Y, which is what we're interested in, raised to the power, little y here, the order of reaction with respect to y. So if you take the log of both sides, log of the rate is equal to log of 
k times z raised to the power z plus y times log of y. Okay. So if you plot this, your initial rate right here, this is going to be on your y-axis. And log of the initial concentration of y will be your x-axis on your x-axis. What's, what's this little y right here? That's your slope, right? And this is going to be your y-intercept. You get a straight line. What's the slope of your straight line? It's going to be the order of the reaction. So in the, for this particular data, here's the graph. It shows here that y equals 2x plus 2.301. So what's the order of this reaction with respect to y? The slope right here is the order of reaction. Okay. Thank you. That's our plot logarithm for log of rate, log of initial rate versus log of initial concentration. That way you have a little bit more uh, confidence in your result. You're not just relying on two data points. Okay, so what we're going to do in the lab is we're going to do a series of these experiments. We're going to do an initial rate experiment. Okay. All right. Uh, what time do we have? Oh, we've got plenty of time. Okay. Another way you can determine reaction orders is to use what are known as integrated rate laws, okay? There are some uh, rate laws for which the uh, reaction order is fairly easy to determine, okay? So we're going to look at rate laws of this type where the rate is equal to, to uh, where the rate is affected only by one reactor. Okay, so if you have a rate law where the rate depends only on the concentration of one reactant, it's relatively simple to determine the order of reaction with respect to that reactant. And, you should, and it's fairly simple to recognize those types of data if you see them in the lab. Okay, well, let's see what happens if your order with, with respect to the reactant is zero. So let's say um, rate equals... So let's say R is our reactant. So the rate of consumption of reactant R, let's say it is zero order with respect to R. So that's R to the zero. What's R to the zero? That's just one, right? So let's rewrite this. We have negative dr dt is equal to k. It's a differential equation. How do I solve a differential equation? What are my variables here? Concentration of R and time. So when I solve this differential equation, I get concentration of R as a function of time. So what do I do? I separate my variables. So I can say dr, I'm just going to move my negative to the other side, is minus k dt. You integrate both sides. What's integral of dr? That's going to be r evaluated from r naught, the initial concentration, to r at time t. Okay, is equal to minus k t evaluated from time zero to time t. So this is going to be R at time T minus R at time zero. What we did here was we've imposed the boundary conditions, basically. Okay. So uh, it's equal to negative K T minus zero. Okay. So that gives you one. R at time T is equal to R naught minus K T. So if it's zero order, what happens? If you plot this, it's your y-axis on your y-axis and t on your x-axis, what's your slope going to be? Your slope is going to be negative k. And what's your y-intercept? 
or not. Okay. So if I were to plot R versus time, what would my graph look like? R naught is the concentration of R at time zero, right? And I'm going to get a straight line with a, what kind of slope? Negative slope. So get a straight line. The slope of that line is equal to negative K. So I can solve for K. Okay, that's what my graph is going to look like if it is zero order. What if my graph doesn't look like that? Then it's not zero order. So if we see, we see. Let's see what happens if it is first order. Okay. So instead, this is the equation that you get if it's zero order. If plot r versus time, you get a straight line. If it's not zero order, if it's first order, what happens? Negative dr dt is equal to k times r raised to the power 1. Separation of variables. I move all my r's on one side and my t on the other side. So negative dr dt is equal negative dr is equal to I'm going to move my minus sign to the other side. So next, dr over r equals, what do I have on the right side? Negative k dt. Integrate both sides. What do you get? This is ln of r. That's a constant, right? equals negative k t plus a constant. That's another way of, so the, you combine all the constants here. That's one way of writing this. We're doing indefinite integral. Now, you apply the boundary conditions. r is equal to r naught at time zero. What do we get? Then you say ln of r naught is equal to negative k times 0 plus c. That allows us to de determine the value of c, okay? the integration constant. So then you'd say ln of r equals negative kt plus, we now know what c is after applying the boundary condition. We know that c is ln of r naught. Okay, so that's your c. So again, we have an equation that we can use to check if our data fits a first order rate law. What would you do with your data? You're going to plot natural log of R. This is going to be your Y. What would be your X? Time. So your time is going to be your X. And what would your data look like? Straight line. What's, what's your y-intercept going to be? This is ln of r naught, provided this is time zero, right? Okay, and so your data is going to look like a straight line with a slope of negative. Okay. So if it's not zero order, r versus time is not a straight line. It's not zero order. You go try it. You try plotting natural log of r versus time to see if it's a straight line. If it's a straight line, then it's first order. If that doesn't work, what do you do? If you don't get a straight line, check if it's second order. It's usually just zero for zero, one, or two. So if, how do you check if it's second order? Okay. The rate of consumption of reactant R is directly proportional to the square of the concentration of R. So let's solve this differential equation. 
I'm going to move all my R to one side. BR over R squared equals negative K DT. I do the next. Integrate both sides. What's integral of dr over r? dr over r squared. What's integral of dx over x squared? Or the integral of x to the negative 2 dx. x to the negative 2 plus 1 over it's 1 over x, right? But there isn't a negative there. There isn't going to be a negative extra. So it's negative 1 over x. So our, in, our left hand side right here is going to be negative 1 over r equals your right hand side is what? negative kt and you have an integration constant which we'll just combine on one side okay uh, then what do we do when t is equal to zero r is equal to r naught so you say negative one over r naught equals negative k times 0 plus c. So what's our c? It's negative 1 over r naught. So we can say now that one negative 1 over r equals kt plus negative 1 over r naught. And negative kt, right? Take the negative of both sides, you can say 1 over r is equal to kt plus 1 over r naught. Do you see something here that we can plot to get a straight line? Plot 1 over r on your y axis and time on your x axis. Okay, so 1 over r versus time. Now, what slope would you get? Positive k. What's your y-intercept? So, this is going to be 1 over r naught, And you're going to get a straight line with a positive slope. That slope is equal to... So, that's what you need to do. If your rate law is that simple. It's either zero order, first order, or second order with respect to one react. Only one react. Now what do you do if it's, it depends on more than one react? Uh, we'll get to that. I'd like to explore these equations a little bit more in depth. Okay. Uh, so here's a summary of those equations. R equals negative kT plus R naught, zero order. Ln of r is negative kt plus ln r naught, first order. 1 over r equals kt plus 1 over r naught, second order. Okay. Okay. So, if the rate depends on concentration of only one reactant, you monitor the concentration of that reactant versus time. Plot r versus time. If linear, you know it's zero order. If you plot ln r versus time and you get a linear plot, then you know it's first order. If that doesn't work, plot reciprocal of R versus time, and you get a linear plot, that would be second order. Now, um, let's see. What's the order of the reaction here with respect to R? Is it first order, zero order, or second order? R versus time, is it a straight line? No, so it's not zero order. Ln of R versus time. It's a straight line, first order, okay? And you can see 1 over r versus time is not a straight line. Notice that you might be tempted to, if you, let's say you did not take data far enough 
into the reaction and you just took this amount of data it might seem like that's a straight line okay so you have the question now is if you're going to do lab experiments and we want to make sure that we have reliable data how far should we let the reaction go we're going to have to be talking we'll need to talk about that okay and there's another thing you have to worry about random errors are unavoidable okay and so you do, you do need to do linear regression on your data and uh, look at what happens here, okay? As your, the concentration drops, you tend to get more scatter in your data. So that's one thing you have to be concerned about when you're doing uh, analysis of laboratory data. Generally, you should be able to get good data for three lifetimes or maybe just three half lives. We'll talk about that in this short one, what a lifetime is and what half life is. Okay. So let's talk about a, what's called a half life analysis as a way of determining the same rate loss. Okay. Rate loss that depend only on the concentration of one reactant and it's either zero first or second order. You can use half life, a half life analysis to determine the order of the reaction. Half life T sub one half, okay? That is the length of time, how long it takes for the concentration to be cut in half, okay? If R is zero, okay, the half-life is directly proportional to the concentration. Why is that? What was our equation for, for zero order? Concentration of R equals negative KT plus R naught. Okay, how long does it take for the half life uh, for the for the concentration to get cut in half? So when we say R is half of R naught, what's time? How much time has elapsed? Plug it in. So R naught over two is equal to negative k. How much time has elapsed? It's called your half-life, right? Instead of t, you plot, you plug in t half plus r naught. So what's my r naught here? Now uh, what's my half-life here? I'm going to move this one over to this side and that one over to that side. I'm going to have k times half-life equals r naught minus r naught over 2. And so what's r naught minus r naught over 2? This is just going to be r naught over 2 is equal to k times the half-life. So what's my half-life? r naught over 2k. So what does that mean? It depends on your starting concentration, right? So the higher your starting concentration, the higher, the longer the half-life. So what happens as time passes? Your starting concentration, the basis for calculating the half-life, would be your concentration will be dropping, right? So as your concentration drops, okay, your half-life is going to get shorter. So as a reaction progresses, your half-life is going to get shorter and shorter and shorter, okay? So that's that's for a zero order. Okay, right here. So your apparent rate, and let's just call that K. So your rate constant is going to be uh, okay, um, and your rate constant is just going to be equal to how's your rate constant related to your half life? Look at your rate constant. Rate constant is going to be equal to R naught over two times the half life. So you can calculate your rate constant from the half life. Okay? So R naught over two times the half life. Your half life is directly proportional to the concentration. So here, an example question here is if it takes 10 seconds to go from one molar to 0.5 molar. How long does it take to go from 0.5 to 0.25? What did we say? Your half-life 
is directly proportional to the initial concentration, right? So if it's one molar, it takes 10 seconds for it to get cut in half. Okay, when it's now 0.5 molar, how long will it take for it to get cut in half? Five seconds. Half life's going to get shorter. You can see that from your graph. Okay, from 10, uh, from point, from 1 to 0.5. If this takes 10 seconds, okay, so from 1 to 0.5. If that takes 10 seconds, from 0.5 to 0.25 is going to take only 5 seconds. So this is going to be 15. Okay? And you can see that these points are going to fall in a straight line if it's zero order. Now, what happens if it's first order? What did we say our equation was? ln of r equals negative kt plus ln of r naught. Okay. So when r is only half of r naught, what happens? Plug it in. ln of r not over 2 equals negative k times t one half. t would be the half life, right? Plus ln of r naught. Okay. Let's combine these two. What do you get? ln of r naught over 2. minus ln of r naught equals negative k times t half. What is this? ln of x minus ln of y is ln of x over y. So this is ln of r naught over 2 divided by r naught. So R naught cancels out. This is equal to negative K times T one half. So this is LN of one half equals negative K times half life. What's LN of one half? LN of one minus LN of two. LN of one is there. So this is negative LN of two equals negative k times t one half. So what's my t one half? I can make both sides positive, right? So ln of two equals k times the half life. So what are we saying here? The half life is equal to ln of two over k. Since k is a constant, then your half life is a constant. So first order, half-life is a constant. And what's, what's ln of 2? 0.693 over. So uh, half-life is 0.693 over k. Or if you measure the half-life from your experiment, you can easily calculate k. k would be 0.693 divided by the half-life. So let's look at an example here. Uh, I don't have an example. Okay. Uh, here, make this. This is K. This half one over half life, one over half life times R. Okay. Uh, you should be able to do this on your own, right? Determine the half life if it's second order. K will just be one over a half life times the starting concentration of R. Okay. Right. So let's take a look at this. Based on the half life, what's the order of the reaction with respect to R? So if you had experimental data that looks like this.
what's the half-life going from 0 0.01 to 0 0.005? How long does it take? 25 seconds. Okay. So when R is 0 0.01, your half-life is 25 seconds. When it is 0 0.005, what's the half-life? How long does it go from 0 0.005 to 0 0.0025? So this is 0 0.003, 0 0.0025 is right there. Right there. So how long does it take to go from 0 0.005 to 0 0.0025? Also 25 seconds. Right? In fact, if you were to do, if you were to start at 0 0.008, how long does it take to go from 0 0.008 to 0 0.004? From 0 0.008 to 0 0.004, you should be able to estimate that that's also going to take 25 seconds. So if your half-life is constant, what's the order of the reaction? Constant half-life, it's first order. So you say then that what? The rate of this reaction equal to K times R. What's our K? First order, what's the rate constant? Ln of 2 divided by the half-life. So 0 0.693 divided by 25 seconds. What's 0 0.693 divided by 25 seconds? Zero two seven seven per second. So two point seven seven times ten to the negative two per second. That's your rate constant. a typical laboratory scenario your concentration okay typically you might be able to monitor it by monitoring some other property like absorbance which would be directly proportional to the concentration okay so x for example here can be absorbance x would be directly proportional to the concentration so what would we have to do without having to actually calculate the concentration you can still determine the order of the reaction using the, the property that you're measuring, okay? So if R is equal to negative KT plus R naught, if it's zero order, what happens? Then instead, how would you solve for R if you know what X is? X is equal to, uh, R is equal to one. X over C, right? So what happens here? You say R equals negative KT plus R naught. How is R related to X? R is X over C. So you can say X over C is equal to negative KT plus X naught over C. Right? So how do I solve for x? x is just equal to c k negative c k t plus x naught. So I don't have to actually calculate r. I can just plot x versus time. What would I get? I'm going to get a straight line, and my slope will just be negative c k. I still have to know what that c is. Right? But at least by plotting x versus time, I can tell right away that it is zero order if it happens to look like that. 
What if it's first order? That was the equation. Ln of r equals negative kt plus ln of r naught. So ln of x over c equals negative kt plus ln of x naught over c. What do I get? What's ln of x over c? That's just ln of x minus ln of c, right? Equals negative kt. And what's ln of x naught over c? ln of x naught minus ln of c. What can I do with ln of c? Cancel it. So what happens then if I plot ln x versus, L versus time? I'm going to get a straight line with a slope equal to negative k. I don't have to convert my x into a concentration unit if I know that x is directly proportional to concentration. If I get a straight line here, I know I have a first order reaction. And the rate constant, in this case, you'll notice your rate constant doesn't depend on concentration for first order reaction. And you can see here, uh, the, the slope will just give me the rate constant right away. I don't have to worry about that proportionality constant. What if you have a zero order, a uh, second order? One over R equals one over R naught plus KT. So what should I do here? One over X over C plus one over X naught over C plus KT. What should I do now? Multiply both sides by by C, uh, 1 over C. Multiply both sides by 1 over C. And what do I get? I get 1 over X equals 1 over X naught plus KT over C. So... If I were to plot 1 over x versus time, do I still get a straight line? Yes, I still get a straight line. Okay, but my slope in this case is going to be k over c. I just need to know what that c is. Okay, so that's how you'd analyze your data. If you're not necessarily measuring the concentration, or you're just measuring something that's uh, proportional to the concentration. That should be just k. Is it time to go? Fine. We'll finish this up next time.